Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to start there, and I'm going to invite you to, to uh, join us there. And it starts out, it's, this is a letter from Paul to the church in Colossae. He says that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by God's will. In other words, he's an apostle because God has called him to be an apostle, not because he just took on that title himself. You know, there were so many people out there in, involved in the church who have taken upon themselves titles. They, they call themselves something special. When all that we are really, and the word minister means servant, what we are is servants, and uh, those titles that people want to put upon themselves are for their own glory, not for God's. And so, but Paul says he was called to be an apostle because God caused him to be an apostle. And also, uh, he has his brother Timothy there. He says, To God's holy and faithful people, our brothers and sisters who united with Christ in the city of Colossae, good will and peace from God our Father are yours. So he greets them, and he, and he greets them with a very pleasant greeting. And he goes on, he says, We thank God always. Uh, then uh, for uh, in our prayers for you, excuse me, we thank God because we have heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. You have these because of the hope which is kept safe for you in heaven. Some time ago you heard about this hope in the good news or in the gospel, which is the message of truth. This good news is present with you now. It is producing results, spreading all over the world as it did among you first from the first day you heard it. At that time, you came to know what God's kindness truly meant. You know, we are, we are people who want to share love and kindness and goodness with as many people as we can possibly see. And why do we want to do that? It's because God has shown kindness and goodness to us. God has given to us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the gospel, a reason for being upbeat, for a reason for, for looking at things in a positive way. What, how can we do that in, when things around us seem to be in such turmoil? We do it simply because we know that what lies before us is not the turmoil of this earth, but it is the, it is the glory of heaven. Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If that weren't so, I, I wouldn't be telling you now that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come back and take you there so that you can be with me forever. See, there is a place called heaven. And there is a place called hell. And we have a choice. You know, we, we said that, it says here that, that God's word, the gospel, is truth. We talked a little bit about truth uh, a couple weeks ago. We, the the truth, truth cannot be uh, anything but true. Truth, you know, truth is always true. Uh, you know, I, I, we were talking earlier today. If, if you went to a uh, went to a school and your and your teacher told you that uh, that you know two two plus two is four, or that you know ten plus ten is twenty, or ten times ten is a hundred, and you go. Well, you know, I, I don't think that that's true. I, I think that we, that should be a different number. That I think 2 plus 2 can possibly be 5, and, and that uh, 10 plus 10 could be, could be 25, and, and 10 times 10, you know, that's, that's, that maybe that's 1,000. And uh, the teacher says, no, it is 2 plus 2, 4. 10, 10 plus 10 is 20. 10 times 10 is 100. And there's no way of getting around that. We could say, well, you know, you're being very very, very dogmatic about this. You're being very uh, narrow-minded here. Uh, you need to have a little bit of tolerance and let me have my own ideas. I mean, that's just your perception there. I mean, that's your idea that 2 plus 2 is 4. Uh, and maybe my idea is that 2 plus 2 is 5. You know, we, and the teacher says, well, you know, you can have whatever ideas you want, but if you take the test and you put 5 down as an answer for 2 plus 2, you're going to fail. You go, well, you're very, very, you're very, very mean and you're, and you're very dogmatic and you're very stern and, and I don't think I want to I listen to you anymore. But the fact of the matter is 2 plus 2 is 4 and 10 plus 10 is 20 and 10 times 10 is 100. And no matter how much we want to change that, it is not going to change. So when the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes to the Father but by me, that is a truth 
And no matter how much you want to change that, it is not going to change. You can say, well, that's just your perception. That's, that's the way you interpret it. No, it is what Jesus said. It is the truth. It is the truth. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the truth. And He goes on and He says, as we will study later as we look, read through this book of Colossians, that there are certain things in this life that if we practice them, if we make them part of our lifestyle, we will not see the kingdom of heaven. These are truths. And because we have the truth, we can rest assured and we can, we can stand on the promises of God and we can know that the glory and the blessings and the joy of be, walking with Christ and, and going to heaven eventually and living with Him for all of eternity is enough to make us filled with joy inside. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, about being filled with the joy of the Lord. It is the understanding that what God's Word says is true and what He has promised us as believers in Christ is also true and we look forward to that. When, uh, when my children were young and we'd go away on vacations, and sometimes we would you know, go to the shores in Florida. Uh, we, would, uh, I stayed, we stayed away from a lot of the amusement places. We went to Disney World one time, I believe, and that was enough. But uh, we, we would go on trips and, and see, to see places, and we, we'd know ahead of time where we were going, and we would know ahead of time what we were going to do when we got there. But sometimes it took a long time. Sometimes we had to drive for hours and hours before we got to a place. But the, but the joy of knowing that when we got to our goal, that there was all of this, these things that we were looking forward to there before us made us able to put up with the journey of getting there. And sometimes the journey had some pitfalls on it. We had to stop and get gas. We had to eat in, uh, in fast food restaurants. We had to... You know, sometimes get tired and, and change drivers and, and so forth. But the thing is, the joy of knowing where we were going and what lie ahead gave to us the strength and the ability to continue on to that goal. And Paul talks to the church in Colossae here, and he says, you know, you have this, this joy which is given to you as a hope. The hope is there. And because you have the joy, you are kind and, and you are loving to other people because you're feeling good about where you're going. You, you understand where you're headed. You understand what's going on out there. Now, if you're not one of those people who understands where you're going and, and you're one of those when if somebody says, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And you say, oh, gee, I, I certainly hope so. I've really tried hard. I want you to know you're on the wrong track. See, we don't get there by trying hard. We don't get there by thinking that maybe we might. We have the promise of eternal life because we trust in Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed on Calvary. We, get, we have the promise of eternal life. Because we know that we can't make it on our own. But that eternal life is, is a gift given by God to those who believe His Word. And all you have to do to be sure that you're going to heaven is to put your faith in Christ and obey His Word. Hallelujah. He says this, this good news that is present with you now and is producing results. And those results are that people around you see that you are filled with joy. We have faith and love and joy because we know the truth. Hallelujah. So he goes on and he says, uh, he learned about this from myself and those that are with me. Verse 9 in Colossae chapter 1. For this reason, we, do not, we have not stopped praying for you since the day we heard about you. And we ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through every kind of spiritual wisdom and insight. See, the prayer, and my prayer for you, when I, when I come up here and stand and I 
bring the, the word of God to you, my prayer for you is that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will through every kind of spiritual insight. That the Holy Spirit will open the eyes of your understanding so that you can see the word of God, recognize the truth that's in there, and decide within your own heart that it is worth following the Lord. I've mentioned it in the past that my life's verse, when I first received Christ, or first gave my life to Christ, came up in Matthew 6, 33, where it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be taken care of. See, when you make up your mind that you are, you're believing God, and you're believing His Word, and you're putting your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone, then seeking His kingdom and His righteousness is all that really matters. You go, but yeah, but you, you can get so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. No, you can never get so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Because the more heavenly minded you become, the more valuable you become here on this earth. The more heavenly minded you become, the more you do the work of Christ in you. And you allow him to work through you and you become a blessing to those around you. And you are doing what you need to do. In fact, in Colossians 1.10, he says this, We ask this so that you will live the kind of lives that prove you belong to the Lord. Then you will want to please Him in every way as you grow in producing every kind of good work by this knowledge about God. See, we, we are told... Uh, we are told in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17 that we are saved unto the good works that God has given to us. And in Ephesians uh, 2, 10, we are told the same. That God saved us. God has put within us the desire, His desire for us to live and do good things on this earth so that we are putting forth the gospel and we are serving others and we are glorifying God through our actions and we are helping others to see the glory of God and see the truth of the gospel because we are living such victorious lives. You say, I don't feel very victorious, Pastor. Sometimes I just really feel like the devil's got me down stomping on me and, and he's winning this battle. Believe me, and when you put your trust and your faith in God, God steps in and the devil can't win. God steps in and the devil can't win. I want you to know that God is still in control. He is still sitting on the throne. Nobody has ever usurped His authority. Nobody has ever taken away His power. He is in full control. Well, and you say, well, if He's in full control, why are all these bad things happening around us? Because God in His, in His wisdom... He wants people in heaven who are going to be faithful to Him, who are going to follow Him. And so through this life that we have on this earth, He gives us every opportunity to prove our faithfulness to Him or to prove that we're not going to be faithful to Him. He allows us to make stupid things, make stupid mistakes. He allows us to go out and, and decide that we, we can make our own rules and we can live according to our own our standards if we want. He allows that because in that He is weeding out those people who are faithful to Him, who are going to stand with Him and, are going, and can live in His kingdom with Him as, as His people. And the others will not be allowed to be there. He is in control. Some people said, well, you know, I believe that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden that the devil took control and God no longer had it. Let me tell you something. If Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, if the God was not, if God was not in control, we would still be in the garden. See, because that was such a nice place to be. But because God was in control, He put them out. And and we know that uh, uh, after the garden, that God was in control of of all of history. And from the very beginning, when He said to Eve, "Your seed." is going to crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will bruise the heel of your seed. And he followed that all through the stories of Abraham and Moses and Israel and all of the, all of the kings and patriarchs and so forth that in, in the Bible that to the day when Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea on the very, at the very time when God said He was going to be in the very place that God said He was going to be. 
and that Jesus lived his life glorifying and praising God and, and showing us the kingdom of God and showing us the love and the, and the power and the grace of God and that he died on the cross of Calvary just like God had told us he was going to do back in, in the Old Testament. He died on the cross of Calvary for your sins and for mine that all things were under the power of God and he had full control. And he still has full control. And this old world and everything that we know about it and all of God's creation is going to pass away one day just like God said it was going to happen. But those who have been walking with the Lord and trusting in Him shall live for eternity just because God said so. So... Paul says we're praying that by this knowledge, this wisdom that you have in God, you will continue with every kind of good work. He says we ask Him to strengthen you by His glorious might with all the power you need to, potentially, or to patiently endure everything with joy and that you will be thankful that you will be thankful that you are called God's inheritance. See, God strengthens us Believe me, we cannot make it on our own. When the devil comes, he comes to steal and kill and to destroy. The Bible says he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It says so in, in, in 2 Peter. The thing is, we can't fight him. I don't care who you are. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how wise you are. You cannot defeat the devil. I hear people talking about, you know, well, I'm just going to tell the devil where to go. You no, know, you aren't. You can't. Only thing the Bible ever tells us to do is that we submit ourselves to God and resist the devil. And as we resist the devil, after submitting ourselves to God, see, there's that... that thing in there. We need to submit ourselves to the Lord. Then we resist the devil. Because we have submitted to the Lord, the Lord steps in and He fights the battle and He overcomes what the devil is doing in our lives. It is not us. When you stand up and you tell the devil where to go, you're just wasting your breath, my friend. Because you have no power in yourself. But when you trust in God and you've been submitting yourself to the Lord, God Stands up. See, people who say the devil took control back in the Garden of Eden, they forget all about the story of Job and how the devil had to go to God and seek for, the, uh, seek for permission to touch Job's life. They forget. They forget how, how the devil tried to destroy the baby Jesus that God protected him. They forget all of these things where God had stepped in and He preserved Israel many times over as they were invaded by other armies. How He, he brought the people who were wayward and, and turned away from Him back to Him by teaching them lessons. Sometimes they were harsh, but He did it. See, God is in full control. He goes on in verse 13, God has rescued us from the power of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of His Son whom He loves. We're told that we were, we were brought out in 1 Peter 2. We were, we were taken out of the, the darkness. He's delivered us out of darkness and brought us into His marvelous light. That we're the people of God, called by His name. That He brought us out. See, we were walking in darkness, in sin, in foolishness, in our own philosophies. Whenever we have ideas and we have thoughts, that go against the, the, the fact that God is supreme, that He is omniscient, that He is omnipotent, that God is in full control. Whenever we have thoughts about those things, we move into the area of darkness. Whenever we move in, we allow ourselves to be drawn away by temptations into sinfulness, and we make sinfulness a pattern of life, we move into darkness. The Bible says that the world, that Jesus came into this world as a light, but that the world did not receive it. Darkness didn't comprehend it, and the world would not receive it because they loved darkness rather than light. They didn't want their sins. They liked their sins, and they stuck with their sins, and they didn't want them to be revealed. So they didn't want the light that reveals the, the sin in our lives, that light that 
blows away all of the darkness that's in our lives. They didn't want that there and they rejected Christ. But Christ has taken us out of darkness. Once we have received Christ as our Lord and our Savior, once we've given our hearts and lives over to Him, once we have chosen to serve Him, He takes away the darkness and gives to us, a, gives to us light. Because Jesus paid the price for our sins. He dealt with all of the things that sin brought upon us and He pushed it away and He's given to us light and life. See, this Jesus that we worship, this Jesus we talk about, He wasn't just a mere man that had God's Spirit working on Him. He was God incarnate. In fact, in First Corinthians or First Col or in Colossians, excuse me, in the first cha first chapter, sixteenth verse, he says, he says Jesus. So let me go back. In fifteenth verse, he says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In other words, God is invisible. He is spirit. No man has seen him, except for the Son. But Jesus is the image of the invisible God, and he is the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? That he was, he was, came, he came about. He was born of God before the earth and the stars and the moon and all the rest of that was out there and was created. And it says that Jesus created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. The book of John tells us the same thing: that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was within the, was in the beginning with God, and by Him all things were created. Colossians says He created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they are the kings and lords or rulers or powers, everything has been created through Him and for Him. He existed before everything and holds everything together. See, it was all done for Him. He is the beloved Son of God Almighty. And everything is for His glory, not for mine, not for yours. He has given us all these things that we might enjoy them. I enjoy the sunrise. I enjoy the sunset. I enjoy the, 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 the morning breeze, the morning air. I enjoy to see the, seeing the clouds in the sky, the flowers and the trees and the animals, and everything out there that God has given to us. I enjoy looking up at the sky at nighttime and seeing the stars out there. I enjoy you. I enjoy my family. I enjoy the embraces of my loved ones. I enjoy these things because God is letting me enjoy them, but they are not mine, they're His. I enjoy the taste of a good peach. But God has given that to me. The, all of, all of the, the peaches that grow in this world are His, but He lets us use some. He lets us enjoy them. He lets us enjoy the rain. He lets us enjoy the sunshine. But it's His. It's for His glory. All of these things were created for Him. The problem is that sometimes we think that it belongs to us, and so then we try to take things in our own hands. And He says here, whether it's kings or powers, you know, we, we try to raise up. We think, well, I know, I know what is best for me. You know, here in America, and I want to, I just want to say this: I'm not anti-American by any chance. I am, I am patriotic. I, I, I would fight for this nation. I'd give my life for it. But let me tell you something. Democracy and voting for a president is not God's way. See, God wants to put the men in office that He wants there. And so many times we put our own ideas and our own feelings and our own likes and dislikes, our own lusts, our own fears out there, and we in install people into places of authority because of our wants without ever seeking what God wants, without ever letting God without ever letting God tell us what He prefers. Remember I said He's in full control, but He allows us to make the stupid mistakes that we make. The question is, are you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? If so, have, during every, any, any election that we have out there, whether it's presidents, vice presidents, governors, congressmen, senators, whoever it might be, dog catchers, are we asking God first who He wants to be in there? Or are we making our decisions based upon lustful and selfish human desires? You can only, I, I can't answer that for you. 
Only you can. But are you seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness first? See, this, all of this was made for Jesus' pleasure, for Him. But He has given to us the right to mess it up. But in the end, in the end, it's all going to come back to Him. In the end, nations and kingdoms are going to be placed under His feet. This earth is going to be put under His feet as a footstool. In the end, He is going to rule and reign supreme. And as followers of Christ, we can rejoice with that. We can shout hallelujah. We can sing praises. Because in the end, it's going to be right. And all of the decisions that mankind has made, which were made for foolish reasoning, are going to be passed away. The thing is, He is also the head of the church, which is His body. He is the beginning. The first to come back to life. So that He would have first place in everything. And God was pleased. Here's the, you know, when God says something more than once, we need to sit up and take notice. We read back here in, in verse 15 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In verse 19, it says, God was pleased to have all of Himself live in Christ. In the next chapter, in chapter 3, or chapter 2, um, in verse 8, it says, all of God is in Christ. See, He says it over and over again. Christ is all of God. When we see Jesus, when we see how He dealt with people, how He, how he loved, how He looked at those who opposed Him, we can see what God is like. Even hanging on the cross, Jesus was praying for the forgiveness of those who had crucified Him. God wants every one of us, He wants every one of us, to come to that place of repentance where we receive Christ and are become the recipients of His grace and His mercy and His love and we can live eternally with Him. Sad to say, not everybody is going to come to that place. There are some people who are going to just say no to God. Jesus talks about, He says, there isn't a sin of mankind that cannot be forgiven. I, I want to make that clear. There is no sin of mankind that cannot be forgiven, no matter what you have done, no matter how bad you think you have been, you have not been in the place where your sin cannot be forgiven. Except for one thing. He says, except when we blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We blaspheme the Holy Spirit. When we say to the Holy Spirit, you mean nothing, you are nothing, I don't want anything to do with you, you, are, you have no power over me. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is simply this. The Holy Spirit came into this world to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And if I stand before the Holy Spirit and say, you have no right to say that to me, you are, not a, and you, you are nothing, I don't believe that, I can live the way I want and I don't care, there is no forgiveness for that. Because the only way we can be forgiven of sin is if we repent. And if we're saying no to the Holy Spirit, we're not going to repent of it. If we're saying, I don't want anything to do with this Holy Spirit, He's not going to tell me that I'm wrong. You're not going to be forgiven of it. But every other sin, the Bible says, Jesus said, every other sin can be forgiven of man. So no matter where you are, what you've done, who you've been, even where you're at right now, this very moment, you can receive forgiveness. Jesus was died on, died on the cross of Calvary so that His blood would wash away your sins, so that you could stand pure before the Father. Then He rose from the, the grave to show that death cannot hold us down. If God wants us to rise and go into eternity with Him, we will rise and go into eternity with Him because He's still in control. And we are not going to get there because of things that we have done. We're not going to get there because of our smarts and our, and our energies and our good deeds. We're going to get there simply because we put our faith and trust in Jesus. 
But God, it says God was pleased in verse 20. God was pleased to bring everything on earth and in heaven back to himself through Christ. See, Jesus came to this earth for one reason. It wasn't to cause the blind to see and the lame to walk. Although we appreciate that. Jesus came to this earth for the purpose of reconciling mankind back to the Father. And His death and resurrection did that job. Now, God leaves it in your hands as to whether or not you are going to accept the gift that He has offered through Christ. And if you choose to accept it, then you also choose to accept the responsibility that comes along with it. See, you can't just say, well, I accept the fact that Jesus died on the cross for me, His blood washes away my sin, and, uh, and so uh, I accept that, so now I'm going to go to heaven, and I don't, have to, you know, I don't have to be concerned about the way I live. We do have to be concerned about the way we live. Because as John says later on, he says, those who are in Christ do not continue to walk in sin. He says, and if you continue to walk in sin, then you're really not in Christ. Jesus said, in my disciples, hear my words and obey what I say. He said, my friends, hear what I say and, and do it, what I say. So, you know, we, he, he puts a condition on these things. And that condition is, you know, the, the salvation is free. The gift of salvation is free. We don't have to do anything to, to have our sins washed away. But... If we want to receive the blessing of it, of our salvation, we need to walk according to the Word of God. I've used this illustration before. See, God gives to us, and, and let's just use it in a very natural. God writes out a check for a million dollars. He puts it there in your hand. Okay, there's my million dollars. I got it. That's salvation. Jesus died on the cross. His blood washed away my sins. There it is. We take that million dollars, stick it in our pocket, and we walk around. Maybe we take it home, put it in the drawer next to our bed so it won't get lost. We know it's there. And we go, I have it. Here I have it. But the million dollars does nobody any good. You live and you die, and once you're dead, somebody comes along, cleans out your house, and there in that drawer they find the million dollar check. God, Christ has given to us a free gift of eternal life. What you do with it means something. What you do with it means something. And what we do with it is to lift up Jesus and proclaim His glory and His, and His greatness. What we do with it is to testify of the Lord. See, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came into you and me so that He might lead us into truth and remind us of those things which we've known. And that we, as Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, that we might receive power to be what? Witnesses. It doesn't say power to be great preachers, power to be evangelists, power to be faith healers, power to be any. We were power to be witnesses of Christ. Now, all of those things. The, the ministers of all kinds of things, and, and, and lay people who walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and God works through them, and He does great things through them. Those are all part of living for the Lord. But He gives us the power to become witnesses of Christ wherever we go. So, in verse 23, or verse 22, let's go to verse 22 real quick. Um, he says, now Christ has brought you back to God by dying in His physical body. He did this so that you could come into God's presence without sin, without fault, and without blame. This is on the condition, he says, that you continue in faith without being moved from the solid foundation of the hope that the good news contains. He says, and I've told you about that good news. See, there is a condition that we walk in faith. That we walk in faith. Do you trust God? I mean, do you really, really trust God? 
See, walking in faith means that I'm trusting Him. I'm trusting Him with my life, I'm trusting Him with my family, I'm trusting Him with my finances, I'm trusting Him with whatever He asks me to do. You know, if He asks us to do something special one day versus another, that we trust that God is going to, uh, going to help us get it done and that it's going to happen according to His will. Are we trusting God? Are you, are you, or, or are you trusting God? in what you think might be the right thing. See, I have found that God's Word has an answer for every dilemma in life. Everything that we can possibly face in life is somewhere there in the Word of God. And He tells us what to do. So, it says in verse 27, God wanted His people throughout the world to know the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ living in us, giving us the hope of glory. And so we spread this message about Christ as we instruct and teach everyone with all wisdom, there, all, all the wisdom there is. So the condition here in, in receiving and having all of these good things, God wants us to, to know the, the glorious riches of a life with Him. Some of you are not experiencing God's riches, God's glory, because you're not trusting Him. You're not seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You're seeking first what you think you need and what you can't do without and what you have to do but you're not seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You're putting your faith in your finances. You're putting your faith in your job. You're putting your faith in the government. You're putting your faith in, in your, your neighbor, your, your husband, your wife, your parents, your children. You're putting your faith in all kinds of things. And you're trusting them. You're, you're seeking their wisdom. You're seeking what they have to say. You're, you're putting your trust in, in people on, on the internet and people on the news or telling you their viewpoints about life. But you need to be putting your faith in God and in His Word. I want to ask you one question. I've already talked about this once before this morning. I want to ask you one question. If you had to live the rest of your life under a communist rule, if you had to live the rest of your life in a, in a, a house made out of, uh, of grass and with a thatched roof, could you still trust God? If you had to go out and scrounge for roots and berries and, and plants that grow wild in order to have something to eat, eat a, eat a squirrel, would you still trust God? Could you still trust God if you lost your job? Could you still trust God under these adverse circumstances? I want you to know that there are many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are trusting God and living for Him under those very circumstances. There are people out there who are, who are being persecuted their families are being ripped apart. They're being killed every day on the streets because they believe in Jesus Christ and they're trusting in God. Can you trust God? I don't want to make you feel bad. I want you, I want you to understand that you have much to be praising God for. You have much to be standing up and shouting about from the rooftops about the glorious blessings of God. And yet so many times we put the Word of God aside so that we can follow the crowds. And we forget that God said that broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads into destruction and many there are that follow it. When we start following the crowds, we better be cautious. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and there are few who find it. And the few who find it are those who are trusting in Christ, who are trusting God with all of their heart, who are loving Him with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Those are the ones 
Those are the ones that are on the, the straight and narrow way. The ones who are going about proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord no matter what other people think. Those who, are, those who are saying, I am going to do what Christ wants me to do even if everybody around me thinks I'm being a fool. They're following the straight and narrow way. There is a condition, there is a condition to our walking with Christ. He says, we spread the message about Christ as we instruct and teach everyone with all wisdom, all the wisdom there is. And we want to present everyone as mature. Paul says this, I work hard and struggle to do this while God's mighty power works in me. See, it is not you, your strength, your ability, your, your, your wisdom and in, in your knowledge that's going to get the job done. It is simply you allowing Christ to do His work in and through you that will get this work done. And you trusting Him to do it properly. And you trusting Him to let it all come out for your good because you love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. See, that's where it's all at. So today, I just want to encourage you. Trust the Lord. Seek Him while He may be found. Examine your own heart and say, where have I been trusting Him and where have I not been trusting Him? And then ask yourself the question, have I sought first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Or have I sought first what I wear, what I eat, where I'm going to lay my head. Matthew 6, 33. Read it. It's a great, a great passage of Scripture. Ask yourself that. And then determine on your knees before God that you are going to serve Him. We sang a song earlier this morning that says, the greatest thing in all my life is knowing Christ. The greatest thing in all my life is loving Him. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. God, you know, the greatest thing in our lives is being called a child of God, faithful unto you, obedient to your word. Help us, O oh Lord, to be that. Father, we just put ourselves in your hands today. We glory in your presence. We thank you, God, for your help. We thank you for your strength. Lord God, left on our own, we would fall down and we would perish. But because you are God, and because you are in control, because you, there is nothing that you can't do, Lord God, help us to walk in victory. That we might, and let us rejoice before the world in knowing that we are on the road that leads to glory. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank each one of you for, for joining us today. And I ask you just to, just to turn, your heads, turn your face toward heaven and just give God praise right now. Hallelujah. We, uh, if you want to contact us in any way, uh, please feel free to. Our address here is 4709 Oglethorpe Street, Riverdale, Maryland, zip code 20737. Drop us a line. Let us know what's going on in your life. We're on, we're on Facebook under my name, Bruce Baum, and we're on YouTube under... Open Bible, Maryland. Join us. Be part of us. And if you live close by, come on in. We'd be happy to see you. May God bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you. May He lift you up and give you glory. Amen.